uh, for the very first two years I went to school, I sat at that little desk there, low infants and high infants. The first thing you got when you went to school was a slate. Slate. <laughs> Slap. <laughs> Writing with chalk. chalk mm. yeah. mm. Right? And seated there for two years. Mm. Later you were introduced to crayons, and later then after chalk you were introduced to crayons, and later then to a pencil, but seated there for two years. Mm. Then you were moved to first class. <laughs> And I'll just show you something there, it should be left in that, but I've seen it here, but now the second is I'll show you this. The first book you came home with was this little one here. The little catechism. Oh, yeah. Penny catechism. Mm -hmm. Who made the world? God made the world. Mm -hmm. And who is God? Mm -hmm. I always say my father. <laughs> right? And uh, it is amazing, people laugh about it now, but the reason, the really, the reason you came home with the catechism first was only the Catholic. The Catholic, uh, the bishop, or the parish priest, he was the president of the school. Mm -hmm. and of course, the Catholic Church managers of the National School of Education mm -hmm. Board. And they were the very first in with a book. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you were introduced then to second class, your second mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. This here is third class, fourth class, and those that separate, separate are, give the idea, a fifth and sixth class. Mm -hmm. Fifth, sixth class was the last court to call before the door was open for you for the world to take you. Mm -hmm. All right? And this is where I finished the tour, and I know well that you haven't been to the house at all yet, but when I started in the house and did the tour of the house, I mentioned 13, 14, 15, 16 children, rare than cashed houses. I referred to those kids at least once in the tour when I was coming down with you, when I mentioned that mother used her nail to be the data for the younger child. And making that statement, then I would hope that people recognise that there was an element of poverty. But even with that poverty, I wanted to show the kids got an opportunity to go to school. The records for the 1920s, 30 show that 30% 30 of children were not out of school at the age of 10, and 70% were gone by the age of 12, for they were wanted for the labour market. So there were very few Irish children finishing national school with an education. And it was for this reason that I placed those kids in this mural. I put with them then my own experience of going to school and being taught by a schoolmaster. And I put with him a poem by Goldsmith that I taught some to many up. A man as he was in a stubborn to view. I knew him well and every truant knew. What had the boarding trimble's learned to trace the day's disasters in his morning face. For well the laugh for counterfeit of glee at all his jokes for many a joke at he. Mm -hmm. For well the busy whisper circling round conveyed the dismal tidings when he frowned. Yes, when he looked across the top of his glasses, like he does in the mural, well then I hope you were smart enough to recognise that there was something else coming to you. <laughs> For we were taught going to school, if you were asked a question, you answered now, not an hour after, otherwise you got a whack that put you into each week. <laughs> so I see that the schoolmaster is in confrontation with the young lad who knew out his late coming into school. <laughs> and as he comes up the road to school, he knows for when he's going to be questioned as to why he is late, so he has the answer prepared at the tops of his lips. <laughs> and as John B. Keane, the playwright, or Neil Tobin, the actor, might say. He answered in a unique Irish fashion, for he answered the question then of the schoolmaster with another question back, and that could have been fatal. Mm -hmm. You're late for school, Murphy. Why? Had I a spoon? Had I? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Me? Yeah. My dad told me. No, that's the <laughs> You're late for school, Murphy. Why? And the child replied, Had I a spoon? Had I? He's waiting for the spoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless you're extremely, yeah. yeah. extremely privileged, it would have been said to you somewhere along your life, growing up as a child, you never left home in the morning without what? It's you were catch out. What good was a spoon to you? <laughs> never leave the house in the morning without. She's after ten. Good job you didn't take it. Wait until I see if I can pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't settle. <laughs> Don't leave the house in the morning without what? The basics of survival. Food. Yes, your breakfast. Your Don't ever leave the house in the morning without your breakfast. I'm sure it was said to you unless you were extremely privileged. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, it was said to everybody else that I know of. Mm -hmm. And that was long before science became a local issue that your parents and their parents before them recognised that as you sleep, your sugars become dormant in your system. Mm -hmm. And if you get out of bed in the morning, don't motivate those sugars and move out into a different atmospheric pressure outside, yeah. the chances are high that eventually you're going to start suffering from headaches and migraine. Mm -hmm. And that is why there was always an insistence that we would have a breakfast. And I can honestly say for myself, coming from 10 acres of land, there was always something for us to eat in the morning. There was porridge, there was a boiled egg, there was bread and butter and tea. Right? 
And but poverty is poverty. I mentioned poverty there. Mm -hmm. And poverty, Irish poverty, English poverty, poverty in South America makes no difference. Poverty is poverty. There's only one thing that flourishes in poverty, and that's what? Love. For that's all that's left in humanity. That's all that's left. And There's we only one thing money can't buy. Huh? There's only one thing money can't buy. Poverty. Right. That's right. That's right. There's nothing in it. That's all that's left is the love between humanity. And that is why we were no different. We had up 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 children in families. And with 17, 18, 19, 20 children in families, and a set of of six spoons, some children in that circle will have to wait for a third helping to come on to get a spoon to eat their poverty to the right, and as a result, go late for school. And when the teacher who taught me that, but explained that to me because I was confused about that, people would say, he hadn't a spoon to eat today. I said, Jesus Christ, we had a spoon. Right? But the teacher who taught me and explained it to me, explained to me, if there was 18 children, you'd have to wait a turn to get a spoon. Yes. And when it was explained to me, then I could see this educational system for what it was. And I can only say about the educational system that there were teachers in that system that shouldn't have been let within an ass's role of the school. Mm -hmm. Should never have been let. Right. But there were some great teachers in it as well. Yeah, right. And I would like to think that those teachers, that is why they were insisting that if you were asked a question, they wanted to pull it out of you straight away, to train your mind to think fast and furious. And I can only think for myself, when I left school at 13, I could read and write, I could express myself, I could add, multiply and divide pounds, shillings and pence without having to refer to a table book. And that is more than I can say about the educational system now. And that is not an indictment on teachers or on parents, but on a system that we are allowing to create where there is no thinking going into the child at all. He's not allowed to think for himself. It's too much of this.